Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday show in which we reflect on the past week's spaceflight activity, speculate over all the launches approaching in the next seven days, and marvel at all the magnificent spaceflight anniversaries that took place this week throughout history. So, without further ado, let's jump right into our first segment, all the stuff that happened last week. To begin, I actually want to go a little bit further back. In last Monday's episode of Space This Week, we failed to mention China's successful launch of a Long March 2F rocket due to the fact that the launch was kept uh, a little bit quiet uh, until it was far too late to be able to talk about it in Space This Week. So let's mention it now instead. Uh, The launch occurred on the 4th of September. The exact launch time is not confirmed and the payload itself was China's first reusable spacecraft, the Chongfu Xiong Xi'an Hangtian Qi, I'm really sorry if I got that wrong, uh, which unofficial reports state is part of the Shenlong program, which is claimed to be likened to the Boeing X-37B space plane. The craft returned back to Earth, touching down at an airbase on September the 6th, reportedly at an airbase at Lopneur. Little is known about the craft itself. The official line is that it will test reusable technologies during flight, providing technological support for the peaceful use of space. As information regarding this launch and indeed the reusable craft itself is incredibly thin on the ground, there's not really much else that we can discuss about this launch. Keeping to the subject of China, on the 7th of September, the country launched another Long March rocket, this time using the Long March 4B. Not quite as exciting as a secret space plane, this launch was to insert China's second Gaofen 11 satellite, which according to Chinese news sources is a high-resolution optical remote sensing satellite, boasting an impressive ground resolution to the sub-meter level. It will reportedly be used in a number of roles, including land census, urban planning, crop estimation, and disaster prevention and mitigation. Ladies and gentlemen, I now bring you to some shocking, mind-blowing, epic news. I am very excited to announce that Astra finally launched their Rocket 3.1 on September the 12th. After successful takeoff, the rocket soared majestically into the heavens, but uh, unfortunately it didn't manage to get very far. After a failure during its first stage, engine burn sent it crashing back down to the Alaskan surface. The source of the failure was due to an issue with the rocket's guidance system introducing some slight oscillation into the flight, causing the rocket to drift from its planned trajectory, which triggered a commanded engine shutdown by the flight safety system. Luckily, this being a test flight, there was no payload loss and Astra themselves feel the launch remains a success as it proves that the rocket can launch and take flight without a hitch. And to the haters out there, rocket startups as young as Astra rarely achieve success overnight. Elon Musk chimed in with some encouragement on Twitter regarding SpaceX's rocky beginnings, reminding folks that it took the now legendary SpaceX four attempts to reach orbit for the first time with their Falcon 1 a rocket pretty similar to Astra's dearly departed 3.1. Rockets, they're hard. I think it would have been a big surprise to everyone if Astra's first launch attempt managed to achieve orbit. And so, with this learning experience and successful takeoff of an orbital class booster under their belts, I look forward to seeing all of the future endeavors that Astra undertakes. We'll be watching Rocket 3.2 with bated breath. Hours later, on the same day, we unfortunately saw another launch failure. This time, it was China's Kwaizu 1A rocket following a launch from a transporter erector launcher at Zhuiquan in the Gobi Desert. The ever-secretive Chinese state has been a little reserved with the details of this mission. All we know is that the specific reasons for the launch anomaly are being further analysed and investigated. The payload lost was reportedly a high-resolution optical Earth observation satellite, which had a sub-1-metre resolution capability. And that about wraps up all the stuff that happened last week. Let's now look ahead to the next seven days. Ah, this is awkward. There are no launches planned for this week. 
So far, the only confirmed upcoming launch dates we have are the Soyuz 2.1B on the 24th of September and the Antares NG-14 launch, which sadly, we can't really talk about these until next week's episode if we're to honour this show's format correctly. But hey, we're still awaiting news on the delayed Delta IV Heavy launch, the next Starlink mission, and the delayed Electron STP-27RM mission. While it's probably not very likely that these will occur within the next seven days, given that none of these missions have confirmed launch dates yet, we can always hold our hope that next week's last week's segment, gosh that sentence was a mouthful, <laughs> won't be completely devoid of news. There is also a chance that SpaceX will pop the top of its Starship SN7.1 prototype after some initial cryo tests have been successfully conducted. Watch this space, uh, pun intended, folks. <laughs> anyway, one positive about this segment being so stunted is that we can start talking about my favourite stuff in these videos a little bit sooner. All the spaceflight anniversaries that'll be taking place over the next seven days. So, uh, let's do that now. On September the 14th, 1958, the first two German post-war rockets, designed by German engineer Ernst Mohr, reached the upper atmosphere. The Mohr rocket was not an orbital class booster, but rather a sounding rocket, a dart-like rocket designed to take measurements and perform scientific experiments during suborbital flight typically reaching altitudes between 50 and 145 kilometers, bridging the altitude gap of weather balloons and satellites. The Moore rocket would fire its engines for two seconds, reaching a speed of about 1,200 meters per second, at which point the unpowered dart stage would detach from the engine stage where it would cruise to a height of 50 kilometers. The same day, in 1959, the Soviet probe Luna 2 crashed into the moon, becoming the first human-made object to reach the lunar surface. We talked about this mission a fair bit last episode, so I'll just leave a link in the description and on screen now if you'd like to hear more about this mission. In other Soviet news though, on September the 15th, 1968, the Zond 5 spacecraft was launched. This would go on to become the first spacecraft to fly around the moon and then re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. There were no humans on board, instead the spacecraft was crewed by a daring ensemble of two tortoises, fruit fly eggs and some plants. The tortoises underwent biological changes during the flight, but it was concluded that these changes were primarily due to starvation and not due to the space travel. Hopefully, the tortoises were awarded a nice hearty meal for their contributions to the space race. Next up, on September the 17th, 1976, NASA unveiled the Space Shuttle Enterprise. Originally planned to have the much more boring name Constitution, fans of the TV show Star Trek wrote to President Gerald Ford in a letter-writing campaign to instead name the shuttle after the show's starship, the USS Enterprise. White House advisors reported that hundreds of thousands of letters were sent in, and since many of the people over at NASA were probably massive Star Trek nerds too, it didn't take much convincing to rebrand the shuttle as Enterprise. Despite being a member of the Space Shuttle family, the Enterprise was not capable of spaceflight. It was built without engines or a functional heat shield. Its purpose was simply to test the airframe during atmospheric flight after being launched from a modified Boeing 747. There was a plan to refit the vehicle to be space flight capable, joining the Columbia and becoming the second spacefaring shuttle, but after some design changes during the Columbia's construction, it became more cost effective to just build the next shuttle, Challenger, around a body frame that had been built as a test article instead. The tragic destruction of Challenger caused NASA to once again consider refitting the Enterprise, but eventually decided to instead build the next shuttle, Endeavour, from structural spares. And so, Enterprise's fate was sealed, and the ship never made it into space. It was, however, restored and displayed in 2003, and it's still on display at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum in New York City to this day, so if you want to see this thing in the flesh, you only have to Go on the next flight to New York. The next day, on September the 18th in 1959, Vanguard 3 was launched into Earth orbit. 
This was the third successful Vanguard launch out of 11 attempts, and its goals were to conduct various scientific measurements, including solar X-ray radiation and the Earth's magnetic field. Being one of the first satellites ever, Vanguard 3 played an important role in the space race between the US and the Soviet Union. It remains in orbit to this day and is expected to stay there for around 300 years before it falls back to Earth. The same day, in 1977 this time, Voyager 1 took the first distant photograph of the Earth and the Moon together. We've talked about the Voyager mission a fair amount in this series' history segment, so I'll leave it there at that and just let the photograph do the talking. Breathtaking stuff. And of course, if you want to check out earlier episodes of Space This Week where we cover the Voyager missions in a bit more depth, you're welcome to check out the playlist in the description. Our most intriguing spaceflight anniversary this week is the Terran UFO incident, which occurred in the early hours of the morning of September the 19th, 1976. A radar and visual sighting of an unidentified flying object occurred over Terran, the capital city of Iran, and in response an Iranian Air Force F-4 Phantom II jet interceptor was dispatched to the location of the sighting. As the aircraft neared the object, its instruments blacked out, forcing the pilots to return to base. Upon withdrawal, however, all systems returned to normal function. A second aircraft was quickly sent out in its place, and as it approached the object, it achieved radar lock. However, according to its pilot, the object suddenly released a glowing missile-like object straight towards the aircraft. In response, the pilot attempted to fight back, but on attempting to fire a missile, the aircraft experienced equipment malfunction. He witnessed another bright object released from the UFO head towards the ground. Despite the equipment failure, he too was able to safely turn back and return to base. During the incident, a nearby jet airliner also reportedly suffered radio failure. Fantastical as this incident was, it isn't without rational explanation. It is more than likely that the bright object that the pilots initially saw was an astronomical body, probably Jupiter, and the bright projectile seen by the second pilot can be explained by the fact that the day of the incident was the height of the annual Gamma Pisids and Southern Pisids meteor showers, and the tail end of the Eta Draconids meteor shower, so it's not unusual for bright falling objects or strange lights to be seen in the night sky. As for the equipment blackouts, the technician at the airbase reported that only the first F-4 aircraft reported equipment failure, and this particular F-4 was known for equipment failures with an extensive history of electrical outages, having only been repaired a month prior to the incident in an electrical workshop notorious for poor performance. With this new context, a temporary electrical malfunction is not a completely abnormal event for this aircraft to experience. Furthermore, the supposed radar lock achieved by the second plane was explained away by a repair supervisor at McDonnell Douglas, the aircraft's manufacturer, who noted that the F-4's radar could have been in manual track mode, causing an incorrect interpretation of radar lock. As for the passenger airliner in the vicinity of the incident that also reported radio failure, it isn't uncommon for radio faults to occur on airliners, which is why they always carry backup radio sets. Really, if you take the incident without firstly assuming that it was caused by some kind of alien spacecraft, then a story about two planes chasing celestial bodies and suffering from temporary equipment failure is not a particularly enthralling narrative. There have been many cases in which aircraft have misidentified celestial objects, and there have been many cases in which aircraft have suffered from equipment failures. It stands to reason then that once in a while, both will happen on the same flight. So there we are. That concludes all of the interesting stuff that happened this week in space flight history. Another week, another set of space flights, another episode of Space This Week. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in, and I do hope you enjoy what lies ahead over the coming days. I'm going to leave it there, but there are some things on screen if you'd like to see more. The left-hand panel is a link to the full Space This Week series, and the right-hand panel is a link to a video from my channel that YouTube thinks you'll like based on your viewing habits. Hopefully the algorithm made a good call. I've waffled on long enough, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you once again for watching, and I will see you next week.